good. All right, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to Tumor Talk. Uh, this is a collaborative effort between Lenox Hill Neurosurgery and the Journal of Neuro-Oncology, where we talk about recently published papers in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology dealing with brain and spinal cord tumors. Um, as you know, we typically have, I'm joined by my usual partners, Gautam Mehta and Jason Sheehan will be here shortly. John Bookbar will also be signing in most likely at some point. Uh, and today we've got a uh, very special guest, uh, usual recurring guest from the publishing house that is Miami. And uh, I'll let them kind of introduce themselves as always. Um, Mike, why don't you start? Sure, my name is Mike Ivan. I'm one of the uh, brain tumor and skull based specialists here at University of Miami and director of our research program. Great. Ashish, um, welcome. Your first time. Yes, uh, first timer. Um, my name is Ashish. I'm a, a, a chief resident here in Miami. I'm interested in neuro-oncology. I've been working with the tumor group for probably about 10 years here, so it's been a good good time together. Great. Well, welcome. We're super excited. Um, you know, I saw this paper, uh, I think it was published last week or so in the, in the journal, and I thought it would be good to talk about, I, you know, you guys are discussing the use of tubular retractors for brain tumor surgery. And I think you have, without a doubt, one of the largest series in this and looking specifically at complications. And the thing that interests me the most is, is more, you know, your experience with it. I think you guys do a, a ton of brain tumors down there. And uh, based on the outcomes reported, which I'm sure you guys will talk to us a little bit about, I think you probably have some, you know, pointers and tips for uh, the viewers who are more versed in surgery, uh, as well as, you know, some reassuring concepts for patients and, and family members who may be joining as well. So... Uh, welcome. With that, I'm going to let you guys kind of take over for a little bit. And as always, this is interactive, so anyone viewing can ask questions, and we'll we'll kind of chime in as we as we come up with uh, specific questions for you guys. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah, Rick's in the audience, so if we could pull him in, that'd be good. And in the meantime, I'll share my screen. Sure, Flora. Can you? Excellent. Okay. Great. Hey Rick, so um, so this is the team. Uh, you know, we hey, have Rick. a your team uh, with this paper, and this is this paper is really just kind of one of the many papers that our team has put together, looking at kind of the indications, safety uh, for these kinds of uh, deep-seated brain lesions. Uh, so Rick just joined us. Uh, you already know Ashish and, and me. Um, so, uh, and this is the paper we're discussing today, minimally invasive resection of, of intracranial lesions using tubular tra retractors. Uh, we did this with um, our, our collaborators here in Florida, uh, the Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kaisorn uh, Chakana came and he included his series from both John Hopkins and Mayo Clinic. He's been a huge proponent of, of this technology for deep-seated gliomas. And then also um, Dr. Stark, who is one of our amazing uh, open vascular surgeons here at University of Miami, is really taking using this technology for deep-seated cavernous malformations to the, to the next level. And then myself and Rick, who, who focus mostly on brain tumors, colloid cysts, metastasis, and gliomas for this technology. Uh, other residents were Dan, um, Ashish, and Evan. So, um, just to go through uh, just a couple of the figures. So, I mean, this is a, a great case from Dr. Stark of a deep-seated cavernous malformation and uh, posterior thalamus kind of coming up more superiorly. It's, it's kind of gives you the, the best, uh, one of the best reasons to kind of uh, use this technology. The, the approaches to this uh, lesion are, are difficult because it's, it's deep, it's close to eloquent area, it's near uh, motor fibers. And the idea of trying to have the minimally, most minimally invasive, less swelling, less bruising of the surrounding brain is key. Um, and, and if you could do this in a way where you could split the fibers and, and get to it simply, uh, then it's ideal. And here's some of the pictures of, of Dr. Stark's surgery where he's able to remove the cavernous malformation, preserve the DVA, uh, and it really provides you more visualization than you would think. Um, so, uh, that's what the post-op looked like. So we looked at 113 patients, and um, the first two are from uh, Kai Soren from Jacksonville and John Hopkins, and the other two are from me, Rick, and, and Dr. Stark. Uh, and so we had 84 patients. Uh, and we, we both used both sy systems, which I thought was interesting, because usually you just have one surgeon that's kind of tied to one system, and you kind of have a little bit of a bias going on. 
But because of multiple fact factors, different surgeons, different hospitals, different time periods financially, um, we both have experience with, with both retractor systems. And that's one of the part of the paper that we looked at here. So just to kind of look at, you were talking about indications, what do we use this for? Well, we, we clearly identified it here in table two. We have uh, the pathology, we have cavernoma, we have colloid cyst, uh, GBM, meningioma, metastasis, glioma, and then others, which would be you know, uh, JPAs or, um, or uh, subependymomas, and, and we'll talk about that. But I think majority of these would be any kind of intrinsic brain tumor. Uh, meningioma is there because occasionally you have an intraventricular meningioma that would be deep that you could get use this to get to. And the other thing that I thought was interesting was down here on the preoperative data uh, where we looked at the, the mean depth target. And so these are, and this is again, identifying what lesions we're trying to target. So the average depth to target was four and a half centimeters from the surface of the brain. So again, these are our patients where you would otherwise have to transgress the cortical surface and the subcortical surface pretty significantly. And, and it's, you know, there's, there's no question that anything you could do to minimize the, the edema to that would be key. And the, the lesion size also being 2.7 centimeters, I mean, that also identifies that in many times the lesion was wider than the diameter of the tubular retractor we're using. And so you would think that you'd be restricted to just small lesions or lesions that were just, um, you, you know, uh, the same size, but in fact, it, larger lesions uh, are, are easily accessible. And Dr. Stark has a bunch of papers also using this technology for intracranial uh, hematomas, where they're obviously taking out much bigger lesions, but of course those lesions are much more softer and suckable than, than brain tumors. Hey Mike. Yep. I, I saw on the, uh, the second table you had up there, one of the lesions was um, listed as pituitary. Is that something that was coming into the third ventricle uh, and you used the retractor to get it there? Uh, yeah, uh, that was exactly. Yeah, that was not because it was in the cello. <laughs> uh, we, we, then we looked at what the extent of resection was. Are we achieving what the outcomes we should be for these kinds of tumors? And in a gross total resection in 72% in of the patients was great. And a, a, a um, maximal safe resection, which was more than 90, 95% resection is how we identified that. Another 17. So, you know, more than 90% uh, ability to get the expected outcomes. And then we have, you know, listed some of the, the complications here, uh, which I think a lot of them are, are more with dealing with uh, your normal kind of brain tumor kind of postoperative uh, issues um, with surround with the with the lesions being in these deep eloquent areas. So a lot of them were, were difficulty with word finding and some confusion and some weakness. I mean, obviously, if you're removing these lesions right next to these these structures. But if you look on the right of this column, the fact that a majority of these lesions were transient means that you're not causing permanent loss, permanent problems. Um, so, uh, so she's just going to kind of go through the systems and then uh, I have some pictures here of how we set it up. Yeah, so th uh, thank you, Dr. Ivan. Um, uh, essentially, you know, I think the, the benefit of these kind of tubular retraction systems is there's two different main companies who kind of offer the approach. Um, system. So NICO is one system that, uh, that, that's used, uh, this kind of, people refer to this as the brain path system. And the other one is Vicor, which is another system which is uh, a little more dull at the tip. And that's another one we use at another one of our hospitals. So we use both these systems um, uh, quite often. And NICO, you may remember them as the brain path system for uh, removal of intracranial hematomas um, and their trial. Um, but uh, Vicor has also been coming up as well. So you go to the next slide. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would say is that the yeah. oval, the oval diameter of the Vicor, uh, you know, some people, I think that's really the major difference. It, some people like that oblique kind of angle a little bit more than the rounded one, but it's very subtle differences. Yeah, and then, you know, the important, the, the difference also in the, in the length of the actual cannula is important too, because the brain path system is a little bit longer than the Vicor. So you just have to keep that in mind when using the two different systems. But um, essentially, you know, whenever you decide to do a, a, a tubular retractor case, you kind of have to be very particular about, um, you know, your planning because your planning is basically the entire case. So when you decide uh, a lesion is going to be amenable for a tubular retractor, you got to pick your trajectory, you got to pick your uh, entry point to make sure it's perpendicular to the brain. You got to make sure that you know where your fiber tracks and your elephant fiber tracks are. So in some of our cases, you know, you may have to do uh, a combination of functional MRI. You may have to uh, 
if you don't have functional MI, you may have to consider getting uh, doing a wake mapping uh, prior to you know prior to inserting the bike cord to kind of get an idea of where the cortical spinal tracts are. Or, um, you know, and so you kind of can at least protect those fibers and decide to plan your trajectory away from that. Um, and I think that, you know, these, uh, this is like kind of a very important part of it. And, then, you know, especially when you're early on, you want to make sure you're per perpendicular to the brain because, uh, because if you're not, then, you, you know, your, your angle becomes very difficult. So uh, I think that those are some important points, especially when you're planning, um, you know, stealth, uh, the Stealth uh, software with Medtronic or whatever, or if you use uh, Brain Lab, uh, both allow you to kind of plan your 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 craniotomies in this in this fashion. Okay. Seems like we have a, tra a question. Yes, that's in video. Uh, yeah, the video is a little bit lagging. So this is just kind of. Let's actually go to the next slide here. So yeah, it looks like. Want to talk mean, through the, the setup here that we use, Sashi? Hey, yeah, before so, we move we do have a question from the audience. Just, uh, I think it goes back to when you guys were showing the tables and I, uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but basically a question from the Instagram live is whether or not retraction improves the rate of resection greater than previous surgical methods. And I, I think, uh, you know, that's obviously uh, not the case. I think that it's, it varies on the system, right? I mean, your data shows excellent resection rates, but there's no, no comparison to being able to see the entirety of the lesion on the brain surface or, you know, obviously an extra axial lesion. But I think that what you guys show, I think, listen, and the, and the reason I really wanted to talk to you guys is that I think the most important part of this paper is that the complications are low um, and having to do with the pathology of a deep-seated tumor in, in what become progressively more dangerous places. Uh, and you guys have a, the greatest experience with this, it seems, or at least published experience where you guys can share some of your tr tricks and tips. And I think that's really the key here. Um, like you guys said, the, the two tubular retractors, there's, you know, pluses and minuses to both that certain people might appreciate more or less, depending on just your own workflow. But I think that you guys are showing that there's a, a, a good resection rate, um, or at least a comparable one in dangerous lesions using this and that it, it, it can be safely done. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, I think, you know, we are actually looking into that as well, because, you know, some of our surgeons don't use tubular retractors at all. And some of our surgeons do, and uh, we're kind of going to go and get the data from each one of the surgeons who don't use it for deep seated lesions, especially the ones that are at least 2.5 centimeters from the cortex, and see whether or not there's a difference in extent of resection using either traditional techniques versus um, the kind of tubular retractors. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see those results when they do come out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and is, is 2.5 centimeters one of your criteria? Is that when you first start thinking about tubes or do you sometimes think earlier than that or closer to the surface than that? Um, I know you, in training, we used to say at least a centimeter deep you wanted to at least have some parenchyma to traverse, but centimeter is not really that deep overall, you know, so. Yeah, I think when you start, when it's a centimeter, a centimeter and a half, you're basically, you know, your, your tubular tractor will basically sitting outside the cortex. It'll be kind of like popping out. Uh, almost near your bone flap, so it'd be kind of it, 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 it's almost futile, you know, for these yeah. uh, more superficial lesions. So, um, I mean, not saying it can't be done. They do have very short, uh, you know, uh, tubular retractors, but I think the main benefit is for deeper lesions. I mean, we did we did a uh, case yesterday, and it was like you know the lesion was just, uh, 1.5 centimeters, and you know it was just basically right at the surface. So, yeah. The uh, second part of that question was about how the retraction itself works. I, I think you guys will get to that as you show videos or some clips here. Just kind of a, if you can, you know, expand on what the retractor is actually doing as it passes through. I think that'll answer that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. The other thing so, I want to say is that the, the brain path uh, has a little bit more of a point and that point is a little bit longer. Uh -huh. And so, you know, sometimes when you're resting on the surface of the tumor, uh, you can't, you know, especially if the tumor is solid, you can't really get all the way down to it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, you have to, to take that into account as to what kind of tumor and what the consistency is going to be and where you want to put that retractor at rest. Do you want to go into the tumor and let the tumor collapse into you? Or do you want to start at the surface of the tumor and maybe find the surface a little bit better and then work uh, from outside in? Uh, and, and Rick's going to kind of talk about that a little bit more at the end when we talk about some cases. Sure. Yeah, I was going to ask you a Question two. I mean, I realize you guys probably never, you personally never have any tumors recur like, like us, but uh, uh, have you used this system for uh, patients who have had recurrent tumors? And if so, uh, what if any challenges might there be in the setting of a recurrent GBM or recurrent meningioma? 
Um, particularly, I mean, this is this looks like a beautiful case that you're showing here with with normal tissue planes or as normal as they can be in the setting of a neuropathologic uh, uh, condition. But uh, have you found that the tubular retractors to be of, of similar benefit or maybe even different benefits in a recurrent setting? Yep. Yep. Prior, prior resection, prior radiation, for instance. Yeah. So I've mm -hmm. used Vicor um, on a couple of recurrent cases. Uh, it's very difficult. And that's what I was going to get into when we talk about cases. You know, just like anything else, there's a, there's a learning curve whenever you use a new technology. Certain pathologies are going to be easier with the Vicor. So anything that has a good margin. So basically, METs are the best thing, uh, you know, just to first get started out on. I would use it on METs. Uh, gliomas, because they have a much less uh, well-defined plane, tend to be more difficult. And especially if it's a recurrent glioma. Uh, those can be very, very difficult with the Vicor because your field of view is obviously pretty narrow. So I've only done it um, on a couple of recurrent METs. Um, and even those are hard because of all the gliosis, the scarring, and the fact that the plane is not so clear. So especially if someone is just starting to use this technology, I would not use it on a deep recurrent lesion. And I wouldn't even use it on gliomas until you've probably done 15 or 20 METs because yeah. you've got to get used to being able to move the two, being able to gimbal, they call it, kind of looking around and really maximizing what your field of view is. But, but any tumor that has a good boundary is going to be easier when you're first starting to learn this. I think that's an excellent point. And I, I, you know, you, you, your results and your experience make this look easier than it maybe is. And, and you've, you've obviously long since uh, surpassed the learning curve. So, but, but for those who are starting out, you know, Looking at this as a as an opportunity to operate on patients who have had who have not had prior interventions and maybe have that well demarcated uh, uh, tumors is probably the best uh, cohort to learn on. Yeah, I would say METs are the easiest, fresh metastases, then colloid cysts, and then I would say gliomas are the hardest and should only be done once you're comfortable using the tube. And being able to move it and well define, you know, well define the planes as best you can. Yeah, and, and for for bigger lesions too, um, whether it be a metaglioma, I still plan out larger incisions, you know, and have that backup plan available if you need to then convert to open. I think that's a you know a, a very reasonable backup plan if you if you have an issue. But I think the more that we do, uh, the more comfortable we are, and, and it's it's becomes much less likely. That, that's an excellent point, uh, Michael. Uh, thanks. So, so this All is right. just a, a case that we did uh, a, a week or two ago for colloid cysts. Like you said, very fresh tissue, small incision. Uh, you know, the cranium is, is about two and a half to three centimeters. Uh, you make it big enough just so you could find uh, an obvious window. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, basically uh, using the navigation uh, uh, kind of system to kind of then find your entry site and then kind of uh, use a small kind of like wiggle to kind of get it through the cortex. And you're, it, it's tough because you need to watch your navigation, but you also need to watch the brain to make sure that you're not pushing it down as you kind of advance the port into the brain very, very slowly. And there's a new, uh, a newer system which allows you to put in this navigated probe like into the, into the actual, um, you know, Vicor cannula and it fixates it there. So it's much easier to use. Yeah. Uh, um, Go ahead, Ashish. Oh no, I was just gonna say, you know, uh, if you want to go back, just you know, just in terms of planning, you know, you gotta make sure you when you plan, you you look at the gyrus or sulcus that you want to go into. So there's two different, you know, options that, you know, people describe. One is going transgyral, uh, which is you know finding you know, a gyrus and basically going straight down the barrel to the lesion in a perpendicular plane, versus finding a good sulcus doing a transulcal approach, big uh, big sulcal split, uh, and basically opening that up and then basically putting the vicor through that opening. Um, both methods have been described. Uh, some people suggest that doing the transulcal approach disrupts, uh, you know, normal brain the least. Um, but you know, you still have to worry about the U fibers at the base of the uh, at the base of the sulcus. So those are two considerations, especially when you're approaching um, these lesions. So um, and if a sulcus is bad and it doesn't look like you can get a good sulcal dissection, you know, we abandon the sulcal approach and go uh, transgyral, which is um, which is uh, equally efficient. You know, guys, yeah, correct. you guys look... focus on that on that comment that she's made, um, which yeah. is absolutely correct. 
So you want to try to do transulcal, but super low threshold to abort and go transgyral. Um, you know, I, I would say that you're able to do transulcal maybe 25% of the time. Uh, and the other times you just go transgyral. We have not had any excess morbidity going transgyral, no, you know, no increased seizures. Uh, so again, low threshold to go transgyral because you don't want to injure all the vascularity, which is in the sulcus. Yeah, I was going to ask you because I didn't see it specifically in the paper, but I wanted to know if you guys had looked at whether or not transsulcal or transgyral changes the, the, you know, seizure. I mean, you had one seizure in the paper, right? I mean, there's so infrequent that I doubt you see anything. Yeah, anything yeah we haven't seen a difference. And that's, that's, um, that's another major point in general, you know, that there's a very antiquated belief the fact that going through the cortex is going to cause more seizures. And that was one of the big kind of uh, problems with this technology was people were very um, obstructionist thinking that going transcortical is going to cause more seizures. And that is a very theoretical risk. But we have done now, I don't know how many Vicors, uh, and there's no increased seizure rate. Uh, and, and this paper really proves that. So I think that's a very antiquated belief to think that going transsulcal, transgyral is going to cause seizures because we haven't seen it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we have a couple of cases here. Uh, actually, we'll start with here. If Rick, you want to? Sure. Um, so, so we'll start with the colloid cyst or the meth that was there before, whichever one. Yeah, I don't, yeah, we can start with, okay. well, I don't so have this much chance here, but you could do that one first. So this was one of my uh, first Vicor cases. 70-year-old uh, female, she had this large brain tumor, she had a PET scan that was negative, had a biopsy of this, it showed adenocarcinoma, she underwent um, whole brain radiation based on the size and the location. Um, it responded for a while and then it started to regrow. So 70-year-old lady started to become weak on the left side, uh, large biopsy proven met, no other evidence of disease, already had whole brain. So kind of limited options here. Um, your options are to repeat whole brain, uh, you, you can do fractionated radiation. It looks like it's too big to do gamma knife or any yeah. kind of radio surgery too. So, you know, you're really left with just surgery. Uh, surgery for this, if you didn't have Vicor, would require a basically a huge right frontal lobectomy, you know, trying to get down to it. Uh, Vicor is an excellent option for this case. Uh, just going trans, transgyral through the right frontal area, getting down to the tumor. So this is kind of an example of where you don't have any other options and these brain path and Vicor systems give you that option. We can go to the next case. This is, uh, this is a colloid cyst, a uh, large colloid cyst. Um, and I've started doing these pretty much all through the Vicor system. Um, one, of the, one of the best learning points early on was uh, I, I, I used the Vicor and I would go down into the ventricle with the Vicor. Uh, if you go too deep, you can cause bleeding and then you mm -hmm. can't see anything, and then the entire case becomes a real disaster because there's bleeding in the ventricle. So what I always tell the residents uh, is that you want to stop the Vicor maybe about three or four millimeters prior to the ventricle, and then you want to get under the microscope, and you slowly want to enter the ventricle so it's controlled and you don't have bleeding, and then your visualization is going to be excellent. Uh, but you want to make sure, again, that you don't plunge into the ventricle because you can cause bleeding, and then the whole surgery becomes much more difficult. Uh, but these are great cases. It, you know, as you saw, it's about a two to three inch incision, um, you know, minimally invasive, small craniotomy. We use the 712 or the 717. This was a big colloid cyst, so we went 717. Uh, and you want to enter in between the superior and the middle frontal uh, gyri, so it's the superior frontal sulcus. You want to stop just before the ventricle, enter into the ventricle, then you're going to see the head of the caudate is the first thing you're going to see, and that's kind of your landmark. You follow the veins back, you find the foramen, um, and then you're able to, to, to you know, get into the cyst. Um, it's also a very good learning point that, that your trajectory for these cannot be like an ETV. You need to come more anterior so you can see into the third ventricle. So early on, I was coming back more posteriorly, and I had trouble visualizing into the third ventricle. Uh, so we do kind of, a, it, it's a very small incision, but you want to go more forward uh, on the forehead. You basically want to go maybe about two inches just in front of the hairline with your, with your small craniotomy. And then that way, when you pass it back, you can see, you know, into the third ventricle. So the colloid cyst doesn't, doesn't move away from you. Um, and then you decompress it and you detach it from the, from the veins. 
Is there a question? The, 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 small, the small diameters for both systems are, are very small. I mean, uh, Rick was talking about the 712. That means 12 millimeter diameter and basically just a big enough size to get a suction and the bipolar is like half open. And so, yeah. you know, I, I think this is one of the few cases that you could try to push your limits with going smaller on the, on the overall diameter size. But there's definitely been cases, even for colloid cysts, that I've tried the 12 and I was just like, just don't feel comfortable, and then had to switch to the 17. But for a tumor, I don't think I would ever try to do something that, you know, use the 12. Yeah, correct. So you definitely want to, you know, as you get more comfortable, you can maybe put in a 12 on this case, see how it goes. And then again, if it's too small, then you just go to a bigger one. Um, I hardly ever use the 721. That's pretty big. That would be a pretty big tumor to use that. But pretty much 717 is kind of your workhorse. Uh, here's the next case. This actually ended up being a septal glioma. It looked like a colloid cyst. Uh, ended up being a, a, a septal glioma. Uh, came in from the left because that's, that's where the tumor was kind of eccentric towards. Uh, and then we got down to it and we realized that it was solid. It wasn't cystic. And it ended up being a low-grade septal uh, D-net. Um, but again, you can use the Vicor for this. You know, these, like, like these patients do great. It's just less pain. You don't have to do a large surgery. You can get good resections. And it, it just goes along the whole principle about if you can do the same surgery and you can get the same results, why not do it through a smaller incision, uh, which is more boutique. This is a, this is a perfect met to use it, uh, you know, like, like to use the Vicor on. This is a newly diagnosed lung met. Uh, you can see where it is, kind of deep left uh, temporal parietal. Um, you can do radio surgery on this, but it's large, a um, lot of edema, it's symptomatic. So ideally, you would do surgery on this. Um, it's also just a, a solitary lesion. Surgery for this, if you don't have a Vicor, is gonna, it, it's going to involve a lot of tran uh, transgressed brain. But you can enter kind of a superior parietal lobule, again, going through a gyrus or a sulcus, whatever is easiest. Uh, I would use for this one also a 717. And this one, you can basically pass all the way down to the tumor. You don't need to stop just before the tumor like you do when you go um, in the ventricle. You can stop pretty much on the tumor. And then just like anything else, you want to get into it, you want to default, and then you want to fold it in. You don't want to try to come around these things like you would a, a, a regular metastasis because you're looking through a small tube and you're not able to come around it the way you would if it was on the surface. You want to get into the metastasis, default, send off specimen, and then once it's once it's been debulked sufficiently, then you can just start pulling in the planes from around you. But, but that's a very critical point, different than a normal metastasis where you really want to come around it and block. On these, you cannot take it out and block. You got to debulk first. Yeah. Uh, here, this is another metastasis, right frontal, colon met. Again, large, solitary, symptomatic, a lot of edema, not a good radiation candidate, yet deep and it's eloquent. Hold on, sorry about that. Um, so this is a good case to do a left frontal vicor. You can see what our path was. We came basically a superior frontal gyrus on the left, small incision, uh, got into the tumor, decompressed, and then came around it. Rick, what do you uh, think so are the biggest moment? pitfalls for these deep lesions? Uh, biggest pitfall for these lesions would be, as I said before, trying to come around it like you would a normal metastasis. Mm -hmm. um, another pitfall would be that you know, when you first start using it, you're not used to basically gimbling it. Gimbling means when you loosen the retractor and you look around. So you have it fixed in one spot. Um, and one of the key pitfalls is you'll think that the case is over, that you're done taking out tumor and you take out the retractor and then you get your MRI that night and you've left half the tumor. Yeah. So because your field of view is small and, and, and it's narrow. So really what, what you have to do is you have to be able to operate with the retractor loose enough that if you want to look up down to the side, that it's movable. And that's called gimbling. And so you have to be able to gimbal, especially after you think you're done, because some tumors can basically go underneath the retractor. And if you don't gimbal, if you don't look around, you can definitely leave a significant amount of tumor behind. Uh, have you guys used, uh, have you guys looked at things like 5ALA for that to help out? Um, Mike is our 5ALA master. No, yeah, you're not, not the biggest adopter, yeah, but Mike, yeah. Home yeah, I mean, I, I, think it, I think that would definitely, uh, it helps for the deep-seated gliomas, you know, that ability. But you have to remember that 5ALA is limited by the direct pathway of the light from the microscope to the tumor. 
But just because you could gimbal your um, your contractor in a different direction doesn't mean that the light is actually getting around the corner and you're going to have some glowing piece on the side that you can then see. Yeah. And then, um, Another you know, these the, the ones you just showed, the cases you just showed were all Mets. And I know you said Mets are the nicest thing to start with. And, and in my mind, the reason that is is because they, they're spherical in general, right? And so you have a nice circle. If you come in, the, if you have a, a, a pathway down the long axis of it or just to the center, you can kind of see in all directions, especially with, you know, maneuvering the tube like you're suggesting. When you have things like deep-seated gliomas where they're a little more irregular, you know, how do you, how do you plan your trajectory for something like that? So this is why I, I, I kind of don't like to use Vicor when it comes to, to, to you know, these gliomas, is that if a glioma is deep-seated in the right frontal lobe, in my opinion, that patient deserves to have the entire lobe out. If it's in the temporal lobe, the entire temporal lobe should come out. If it's in the occipital lobe, the entire occipital lobe should come out. So I don't believe in doing kind of lesionectomies for gliomas um, mm -hmm. in general, so those patients wouldn't get Vicor. The other indication would be like a thalamic glioma. Um, in my opinion, you know, thalamic gliomas, I think resecting them has too high a morbidity for the patient benefit. So I don't use it on thalamic gliomas. It's very, very uh, specific gliomas. They would have to be in a deep area that's not the thalamus where I can't do a lobectomy because I feel like lesionectomies are not ideal. Uh, yeah. and, and, and I think, you know, taking out thalamic gliomas, in my opinion, I know people have their data, I, it's not worth it because the risk of of the surgery is so high and the benefit, as we all know, is relatively limited. So I don't take out the lambic gliomas. Yeah, and great points. Yeah, yeah I mean, I um, think that with gliomas also, it's a little bit more tricky to know, understand like what the consistency and the vascularity and, and, and for those tumors. There's definitely tumors that you get in there that are soft, necrotic and dry and, and you're able to debulk very easily. Uh, and then there's also ones that you get into there, and they're very, very vascular. And, and that's where that's an issue for the Vicor, the brain pack, because you're dealing with a small area. So yeah, what do you guys, what do you guys use? You know, your your tubes in the in the lesion, and you're backing it out as you come out, or you're or you're debulking. And there's tumor behind your tube above you. There's the blind spot, right? Wow, right. How do you guys focus, or do you pay special attention to the blind spot, or, or what do you do? Yeah, I mean, I think the other things we didn't talk about is, that, is the, the preoperative and the beginning of the surgery. The things you do differently here is you don't use mannitol, you know, we don't lower the PCO2 because you're wanting a little bit of the brain pressure to kind of compress the lesion in as you develop it, just like you would for an ICH tumor. Uh, and, and that helps you with alleviate some of the blind spots as the brain collapses around you. The, uh, the other point to make uh, when you're selecting patients, especially if you're doing colloid cysts or intraventricular lesions, is, is the size of the ventricles. If the ventricles are pretty small, you have to be very careful because the anatomy is you know, pretty, obscure, like pretty uh, obscured, when, especially when you enter the ventricle. So you know, we had a few patients who have small, who have small ventricles with small colloid cysts. Uh, so those, those patients are, are particularly difficult because you have to know your anatomy really well. So I recommend doing those later on when you're a little bit more familiar with using the system. Great. And, and I just want to add, I think Ricardo's uh, comments about a, extent of resection and glioblastoma is, is perfect. And, and I want to raise uh, uh, attention to the fact that we just published a, a topic review on this in Journal of Neuro-Oncology from the Hopkins Group. It was published uh, less than 10 days ago on, on uh, supertotal extent of resection for glioblastoma. And, uh, first author, Jackson, it's, a, it's an excellent paper on this subject. And Ricardo, you're absolutely on the mark. Yeah. yeah, we have our own paper that's coming out, uh, Shaw et al., uh, also looking at kind of supermaximal resections, uh, looking at lobectomies versus lesionectomies. Uh, we've, we've had a huge experience looking at lobectomies for these tumors, uh, and so our paper, uh, you know, basically supports the same thing. If you can do um, these tumors and you can, you know, take out the entire lobe, supermaximal resection does seem to have uh, benefit. Right. No, I yeah. agree with you completely. Absolutely. All right, guys, we've, we've hit our 30 minute mark. I, I can't uh, express how much gratitude I have for you guys coming along and talking. I, I love these conversations. Um, I think, again, you know, this is a, an important paper uh, showing what can be done and showing the safety of these um, things and of the tubular retractor system. And also, you know, showing that both retractor systems have their pluses and minuses and, and are both capable of achieving the same outcomes. And so 
I uh, wanted to say thanks again. This is going to be on YouTube probably by the end of the day tomorrow in case anyone missed it or tuned in late. Um, Jason, got him. you have anything else you want to add? I just want to say thanks to everyone who's, who's joining and thanks for the Miami team. And just wanted to, want to put in a, a note as you are hopefully following our social media platforms, the Journal of Neuro-Oncology's Impact Factor climbed again this year. And we're very proud of that and the, all the uh, work that the this group and the peer review committee and contributors have done to make that happen. Thanks. Congratulations. Awesome. That's awesome. Congratulations on that. Yeah, and I, yeah. I just want to commend the uh, the Miami group. You know, I, the, this series really focused on deep seated lesions, and so it wasn't just applying this technology to any kind of tumor and uh, and uh, including superficial tumors or anything like that. This this is really the uh, the cohort that we want to focus on, and it really gives us a good idea of what the results and outcomes are. So, uh, thank you for that. Great. Yeah, I just want to put a, a quick plug in for tomorrow night for our Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium, uh, five o'clock, talking about anatomy guided surgery with Dr. Rivas from Brazil. Uh, if anybody's interested, please tune in. Who, who incidentally is on the editorial board for the Journal of Neuro-Oncology. Excellent uh, speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Take care. And uh, panelist number three happens to be very charming. So. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Anyway, thank thanks you so much for your time. Thanks a lot. All right, everyone. guys. See Take you next time. Next week. All right, Randy. Take thanks care. for organizing. Always. Bye. Bye.